Okay, guys, welcome to the channel again. I've got a special treat today. I'm going to do another video interview with one of my friends. This is Dave in, in Louisiana. He's a member of a texting group that we have of some select audio files, mostly from Louisiana. I'm from Houston. I'm the outlier. But uh, Dave has come and visited me here in Houston, and we've gotten to know each other a little better the past few years. One thing I haven't done is had a chance to check out his system, but one thing that the familiar refrain from people that have is that, you know, it's amazing imaging, things that they haven't heard before and been very impressed. So instead of just me talking to Dave and getting insights on what works for him and some tips, figured might as well record an interview with him, share it with you guys and see if you can't gain any insights just as I'm doing today. So. Dave, without further ado, maybe I'll turn it over to you and you could just give us a little background on your equipment and system and anything you'd like to share to start. Sure. Uh, Jason, thanks for, you know, having me on. I know you've been wanting to do this for a while. And uh, I guess for me, the big thing, it's, it's all about the room listener speaker interface. That's, that's the key to when you have that, you're in a good position where all the other variables are going to work. You know, if, if you don't have that to a certain point, nothing else really matters. Uh, an analogy I like to think of is you've worked hard your whole life and you decide, I want, a, I want that sports sedan. I want that high-end Audi or BMW, high-performance sports sedan or sports car. And you've wanted it, you deserve it, and you can get it. And so you do. And you've got this beautiful car, but you live out there in the country somewhere, way out there where all you have are dirt and gravel roads to drive on. You've got great pride and ownership, but you're never gonna know what that car can do. Unless your end goal was just to own it, then you've achieved it, you've arrived, you're there. But if you wanted performance along with it, you, your money would have been better off spent on a much lesser car that would give you the same or even better performance. And then with the money you saved, continue saving a little bit more and maybe you can buy a house somewhere where they have good roads. And then you can really get the car of your dreams and be able to enjoy it for what it is. I think a lot of people, audiophiles, they, they see the high-end gear and they love it, they lust after it and they want it, but they're not in a position to allow it to do what it can do for them. Yeah, that's a good analogy you bring up because so many systems I've seen online in the various forums, especially Facebook. I know you're not pretty active on Facebook, but people post their systems a lot and you see eighty, hundred thousand dollars systems crammed into, you know, tile floor rooms with windows all around. Oh, exactly. A lot of their performance is just being wasted. Yeah. A lot of glass too. You see a lot of windows and there's no window treatments and you just wonder you know, but who knows? Uh, maybe they know something we don't, that it could work for them. Right. Because, you know, we all, we all listen for different things in this hobby. You know, it's something that, uh, it's an individual thing. It, it really is. Now, my room, it, it's evolved over time to what it is now. It didn't start off this way. Um, I live in a subdivision, and I have a very small home. But it was built around 1976, and at that time they had decent property, like 100, about 100 foot across, about 125 foot deep. And this is, like I said, a small home, and so I had plenty of room to build something. So what I did, I ended up building a, a two-car garage with a listening room attached to it, and I have it connected through a, a covered walkway, you know. And having a room separate from the house, it, it allows me to enjoy music later in the evening when like my wife likes to go to bed early, she gets up early, I, I won't bother anybody and that sort of thing. And I built it at a time when it was reasonable to do such a thing. I don't know if I could afford to do what I did then, today, you know. What are the room measurements um, that you have? Well, right? the current room, well, the, the, what started off to be the entire building was uh, 35 by 22. That was with a two-car garage, so my original room measured, those were outside dimensions, so it was uh, 21 by 15 with a cathedral ceiling of 12 foot, a, a 10 inch, about a 10 foot uh, average. 
So actually the room was ideal. It was uh, one of those ideal ratios, 15 by 20, 21 by 10. And I built this room. I just knew it was going to work. You know, it was, the dimensions were right. The math was right. And I was so excited, you know, when, it, when I got finished and I moved all my gear in, I had my laser measurements, everything is set up, everything's ideal. And when you do that, you expect the clouds to part, mm -hmm. the sun to shine, you hear the angels sing in the background. And I turned everything on and there were no angels singing. Mm -hmm. It was, I was shocked. I said, here I did, I, I did all of this and still, I have a room I've got to work with. Any enclosed space, ideal ratio or not, it's only a starting point. And I, I mean, I had to put a lot of work into the room to get it where it was semi-reasonable to me. Because I've always had, I, you may not have noticed, but I tend to like larger <laughs> speaker systems. Right. And I've always had them. And uh, they require a certain amount of room. I didn't have these when I first built the room. The ones I had were, were large, but not quite like this. But it just wasn't working. I mean, it wasn't allowing them to be what I knew they could be. I tried and band-aid after band-aid with acoustic treatments. And I got the room close. But anyone who would he was here in those early days, uh, like Doug, uh, you just had Doug over at your place going, you know, for speaker shopping there with the MBLs. And uh, Doug was here then, and he'll probably tell you that the room was nice. It was interesting, but there was no greatness here. It was less than what it should have been, you know. But I lived with it for, for quite a while, just trying to make it work. And I learned a lot in those years about acoustics, things I probably should have learned before I built the room, and about how to fix issues and problems. Because the big issue with smaller rooms like that is, well, of course, base issues, but the, it's not the peaks, it's the deep knolls. You can have like troughs sometimes very broad and deep. And I had a bad one right around 44 hertz that I was able to deal with partially, but I just could never, you know, get it where it was good. And that sets the foundation. That's the solid feel of the base. That's the, the meat of it. And, Without that, why have this? It makes no sense whatsoever to have something like this if you can't allow that to do its job. Right. Well, I think it's important what you mentioned, learning, and to back up a little bit for people who don't know you too well. We talked about people that are okay with putting mega dollar speakers into glass tile floor rooms because their perceptions may be they like it. But a lot of it has to do with them not having exposure to, like we've gone to many shows, right. and going to many CESs. It might be good to brief people on some of the people you've, shows you've gone to, people that inspired you, some of your background, which kind of gave you that higher level of, you know, requirement and standards that you wanted to get out of your room. Because most people would look and say, probably what you're saying wasn't that great, is great to some of these people with the speakers oh. on tile floors, you know. Sure, it's all relative, isn't it, to what you're used to. Now, before I built this room, of course, I mean, the room I'm talking about is not the room I have now. You know, that was the, the original room I had built. Since then, I, just five years ago then, I went ahead and I decided the room I had, not, not good enough. So I, I took one of the garage stalls. I increased the room another 10 foot. So... The original room, the 21 foot was the long wall. And I was listening on a long wall. But now with the added 10 feet, the long wall has now become the short wall. And I have a whole 25 foot now. Another extra, I guess 11, 12 feet behind my listening position to the rear wall. And that change made all the difference in the world. And so at that point, halfway through the room, your listening position? I am back uh, about 14, about 14 foot from the front wall. Okay, and you said you have about 12. Then feet. I've got another, about another 12 or so. Yeah, 
all yeah. the way to 25 foot, yeah, behind. Going to different shows, like you said, it, it, it's, it's an eye opener, an ear opener too. Because what's amazing is often they don't have a long time to prepare those rooms. And often they're, they're, they're bare rooms. They're like a motel room. They're not set up for acoustics. Right. And sometimes it's amazing how good of a sound that, that they can achieve in such a short period of time of setup, you know. And uh, well, that might be also something that? I want to touch on at some point is those ASC tube traps and oh, yeah. some of the room treatments. Because I just recently had a, pair, a set of those. And it was kind of ear opening for me to see how powerful they were, especially in a small room. So it gives me a new level of appreciation for the rooms that we go to the shows that are using those. And you think that there's really not that much room treatment. Those things are actually quite powerful. They are very powerful. Uh, you can see in the back corner there, I think those are 10 inch rounds on the side of the uh, base column. Now, I do have an interesting story about those that we can talk to. And I just did this change about uh, three days ago. And it all happened by accident. Now, I was actually doing something else. And I didn't have a place to put, the uh, to put them because where I had them, I was making the change. And so I had to put them somewhere. So I just threw them in each corner. And what surprised me is you can see in the corner a little bit but those corners, it's deceptive. You can't really tell by the picture, but those are massive base traps in each corner. They're about 14 inches thick and they're about three foot wide. They're, they're wedge shaped. And all of my corners have those. And even with that already there, adding those little tube traps in, for some reason, it was astounding what, what, what happened. I, I just, you know, um, originally I had them behind, these speakers are dipoles and they're very similar to the old uh, Infinity uh, Genesis four P systems. They're just a little bit smaller. What's different is the wings on this section. This is the RMV 60, the upper range section. The Infinity and Genesis, they were like out and they were like gently curved away from the drivers. Mm -hmm. Well, these are pointed back into a V shape where it creates a reverse horn for the uh, dipole, rear dipole effect. And so I had to tube trap to absorb some of that dipole energy along with the, the artificial plants back there. They, they help to diffuse all of that to create the, the sound stage I want. Well, I was visiting a friend's home uh, the, uh, on Sunday and it is a wonderful sounding system. And I noticed it just had that sparkle to it that I, I really like, you know, and my system is a little darker in some ways, at least it was a little bit darker in some ways. So I wanted to bring that sparkle in. So I, I pulled those tube traps out trying to recreate a little bit more of what I had heard at, you know, friend's house. And, uh, and I got it, you know, it, 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 I got that energy I wanted. And so I just had to get the tube traps out of the way. And what I found was, for some reason, and I have no idea why this is, but the bass, which is already very solid and very accurate, became much more solid. And I have no reason for it. And a little tube trap like that should not make that kind of a difference mm -hmm. um, on either both sides. But for some reason, this little re rearranging of acoustic treatments changed the spectral balance. It gave me a brightness on top that I wanted, that nice diffuse shimmer, but it also solidified the bottom end. Yeah, a lot of people may not realize yeah. that those tube traps, they're not just base traps. Some of them have the ability to rotate and exactly. you have a fraction for the mid-range. And that's another thing that some people don't realize. Yeah. They've got a membrane in there, depending on how you rotate it. Right. The energy. But my room as it sits now, I think you might be able to see, this is a, I just did a printout. You see it's, this is uh, from 20 to 100 hertz. Now going up to 200, it's, it's the same. It's, it's very flat. You know, I have no deep nulls, no peaks. Everything is as it should be. That's good. And, uh, You're not you using know, room treatments either. 
I mean, uh, room correction software, no, no digital room correction. I do not do any automatic correction, no. I, I, I do manual correction. The speaker system is, uh, uses an outboard digital crossover. I'm using an Exilla 4080. Okay. It allows me to uh, triamp the system. And uh, that has a lot of parameters in there where you can adjust, of course, the different ways you want the crossovers to work, as well as uh, different types of equalizations, parametric and otherwise, you want to put in there. So I put in a lot of different cuts at different places to help bring the peaks down, which are easy to control, you know, when you have a base peak. By leveling those off, it just allowed everything to, you know. Yeah, that's a good point. I've done a separate video on my wisdoms, which have an active crossover, and the power to be able to tailor your crossover to a room is just so far superior oh. in my mind to any passive crossover where you just have to live with however that speaker was voiced right. by, by the manufacturer. Right. And a jimmy rig your well, room to it. You have a lot of people that are down on a digital type crossover. They say, oh, it's digital. You're going to mess the system up. But the benefits so far outweigh, if there was a negative, I haven't found it. You look at a company like Legacy Speakers and the Exilla crossover that I use, that's exactly what he uses, Bill Donaldson. He, he loves that thing to death and uh, completely unmodified is what he likes to use. Uh, he came out with the Wavelet, which is an advanced version of the Exilla, which he had basically designed to give more of what he wanted for his speakers. But that's like a, the Wavelet is an option what you get standard is this 4080. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. He, I, I saw that he is doing that. And I knew the new PS audio speaker is going to have room correction built in on the bottom end. Mm -hmm. And you're seeing that with the key audio. I, I think, you know, the key three are amazing speakers. Yeah. They so, truly are. Yeah. I think people are realizing there's absolutely no reason to avoid using uh, digital room correction, but like anything, it can be detrimental if you use it in the wrong way. And I've found, you know, if you add too much gain and you don't have enough headroom, you can induce digital clipping. Sure. You know, if you're trying to add, but like you're saying, if you're doing it to reduce, it's the perfect tool for sure. Right. No, I do have a few, when I add, we're talking like three quarters of a DB here or there. Right. You know, very mild, very broad type of, of things. And uh, now cuts, I do do deeper cuts. Sometimes you, you think, well, I'm going to cut 4 dB here. That doesn't equate to a 4 dB change. Often you've got almost double what, it, what you want to affect for that. The range, yeah, that you're doing. It can make a big difference. And that's what I think people go, go crazy with these EQs, thinking they need to do, they think 3 dB isn't that much. 3 dB is a lot when you're in well, it is. a wide range, a wide Q. And you can really change the tonal balance. So, yeah, it's good to hear that you'll make corrections even down to 0 0.3, 0 you know, three quarters of a dB. You know, I've seen the found the same thing in my system that minor changes can go a long way. They really can, no doubt about that. So, I'm sure a lot of people are drooling at the gear that you have in the background. Why don't you go through quickly the brands and you just slide? There we go. How does that work? All right. Yeah. Yeah, these, these speaker system is are made by VMPS and uh, designed by Brian Chaney. And actually, this as a system is serial number one. That was the very first owner for this system, and they're very, very rare. I don't know how many are out there. I know of one other one, one other complete system. And I don't know of any other ones. Uh, there may be, we had a, a forum, the VMPS forum on Audio Circle was a nice community where everyone pretty much knew what was going on, everyone was tuned in. And I don't remember hearing of anyone else, uh, you know, doing this. Now, when it came out, you could, they were separate. The, the V60, this came out first. And the towers, base towers came out a little bit later so when I first got my V60, I was a second owner to receive the, the V60 system. I was given some subwoofers to, to work with until the base towers were finished being manufactured. 
And uh, then I became the first owner of, of the base towers. And I don't know, there may be three other pair out there. Maybe. I, I don't know. Now, are those sealed uh, towers or are they? They actually they are. They're, they're sealed. Now, what you can't see is uh, they're, they're actually a lot larger than what they look. I'm pretty far out in front of them. I'm, I'm a good five foot away from the base tower right now. And I'm at least three foot away from this one. To kind of give you an idea, you know, they're, they're nice size. I'm still in front of the base tower. I'm not, I can't get even with it because of the tube trap. But right. they're about 69 inches tall. They're 14 inches wide. But the thing is, they're over 19 and a half inches deep. So they're a massive structure. And on the sides, which you can't see, are two, one on each side, 15 inch passive drivers. So he always believed in sealed enclosures, but using passive drivers, radiators. Radiator, passive radiator. Right. Now, on the very bottom of the base for the tower, you can see it's slotted. The idea there was originally, it was designed to also have a 12 inch passive radiator, downward firing, but when he got everything assembled, he realized he did not need that. And so that's just sealed off. Okay, and what is the rollover to that tower? Right now, I'm right about 103 hertz. Okay. So the, are those uh, little planar uh, modules, planar drivers, okay. and they can go down to the 100 hertz, or do you have a mid-range on that as well? well? You see the very bottom, the base? Yeah. There's a six inch and a half inch drivers down there. So that's actually the upper base unit. Okay. So it actually has a tweeter in the middle, which is a true ribbon tweeter. And then the planars are, you know, on either side. As a system, those go down, I think I have them down to about 260 hertz. Okay. And then that starts to roll off at 260. And then the base module itself, the footer for this rolls in at 230 hertz, and it rolls off naturally in the 70s. So it's designed that way, and the crossover slope is such a way to do a proper blend that really works well between the two. And then I have those, that rolls off naturally, and then the base towers themselves start to roll in around 100, 103 hertz at a slope that matches. Is that uh, sealed or is that also dipole of the footer? Yeah, that is sealed. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that is a, uh, and the base tower itself, it's, it's very heavy duty. It's like two inches thick all the way around. Okay. It's a massive structure. It's, it's over 300 pounds, the base tower by itself. Wow. I mean, this is a life's commitment here. I mean, these are, <laughs> this is a partner that you've got to make friends with right. because they're just too, you know. <laughs> So literally, you built the room around the speakers. Absolutely. Yeah. Had and to be that, done. And that's so the when I had them. Well, I had them in the original room, and I just knew they were capable of so much more. Mm -hmm. And I had to get them realized. I just, it, and so when I made the room larger, it's just, you know, incredible change. It's actually, yeah. they're, they're doing what they can do. I mean, if there's one takeaway, I mean, I haven't heard your system yet, but from what everybody's told me, I can just tell right off the bat, when you have speakers this size, this mass, I'm capable of such full range reproduction and tailoring, you know, what you just said is the key. You built the room around the speakers. If you make that investment, you know, even if you have the, the mega dollar Wilsons or whatever, Magicos or whatever, if you're not building the room around it, like we said to start, you're really never going to get the true performance of that. You're handicapped from the beginning. Right. Everything's always going to be a compromise, and you'll continually be creating Band-Aids right. instead of, you know, I mean, part of my audio philosophy is that there's, there is no one right way to get from where you are to where you want to be. But there are a lot of wrong ways to, to take that path. You know, it's just... There's so many variables. You talk to any five audiophiles and ask them, what's the best this, or what's the best way to do that? You'll probably get four or five different answers. Right. You talk to five different speaker manufacturers about what is the best 
speaker or what is the best way to design a crossover or whatever it is, they're all going to give you completely different answers because you have some people who believe fully in dipole, some are bipole, some are monopoles, the mini monitors, others are, you, you know, there's so many different ways. Here you got the MBLs, the Omni, it's a whole different, they're all different, but yet they're all trying to get to basically the same place. And yet all completely different paths to get there. And yeah, no one is right, they're all they're right. You know, it's, it doesn't matter what design you choose. If you've got a poor room, they'll all sound flawed. So exactly, it's and what I've learned over the years too. It, money does not equal good sound. It's all about the synergy. It's all about the balance of how things, you know, work together. I remember a lesson I would learned years ago. I had uh, so when I had Infinities, I had Infinity RS One Bs. Fine speakers by, by all accounts. And I had the right electronics for them. I had the, the audio research on the top end. I had the, the correct Eagle 2F for the bass towers. And, but I thought I had nice sound, you know, until I visited a friend's house who had the same speakers. And he didn't have the audio research. He had an old Dynaco Stereo 70. And he had, I don't know what God would have on the bass towers. And but what he had was the room. Mm -hmm. And I tell you what, it was incredible. You know, his electronics were like 40 years old. And it was just, people would look at today and say, well, that's trash, that's garbage. Why even have that? Right. And it had nothing to do with the gear. It was because how well it all worked together. Right. And I've never forgotten that. No, I think that's a good theme for the first half of our talk here. Might do a little break here so that we can divvy this up into different um, episodes. But yeah, getting to the, the theme of this first part is your room is nothing you should overlook. And I'm glad we talked about that first and then your equipment. But when we come back, we'll talk about your equipment and other philosophies that you have that you can share. Sure. Well, one thing to add about the room, I think, is, is, you know, I know it's an expense. It's something you have to factor in. But when you look at what some people, the money they spend on certain things. You were telling me the other day about the, the Nordos, the speaker cables that were being used in the demo the other day. And uh, was it $40,000 cables, yeah. right? Yeah. And this, this room, the garage, all the cement work leading up to it, at the time when I built this, didn't cost that. Mm -hmm. You know? And uh, so it's all what you're willing to, you know, put off a little bit of equipment, you know, buy that lesser car just so you can move to a better neighborhood where you get to learn to drive the car. Right. It's all about that. No, yeah, that's, that's, that's important to note. And so many people put their priorities in the wrong area. So hopefully those that are watching today can uh, digest that lesson and save themselves the trouble that so many others learn the hard way. But let's take a quick break and then we'll come back with part two.